Hi, everybody. We've had a lot of great speakers this evening, and I am happy to introduce our panelists. Um, are we there? There we are. All right. Thank you. Uh, we've had a lot of great speakers tonight from the state so far, and I am happy to uh, be able to moderate a panel of folks. Uh, we've got a couple of lawyers. We've got a banker. We've got a professor. And we've got myself. I'm Thadbot, blockchain architect for the state. Um, happy to be here tonight. And what we're going to talk about is bridges to the state. And that is going to follow up on a lot of the great conversations that we've had this evening about DAOs and how those fit in to um, operating and being in the crypto and crypto adjacent industries within uh, the state of Colorado. And we've also uh, got Caitlin here from Wyoming who can give us some insight into what they've been doing up to our lovely neighbors to the north. Uh, Nathan, do you want to start? Introductions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm Nathan Schneider, and I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I work on uh, cooperatives, DAOs, and everything in between, all kinds of ways to share ownership and governance in communities. Caitlin Long, uh, founder and CEO of Avanti Bank. We're going to be making some announcements next week. Uh, we're, we're getting close to launching. Uh, and I'm from Wyoming, pretty active in the legislative scene in Wyoming. We've passed 24 laws in four different legislative sessions. We've got seven more on tap for the legislative session that started this week. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I'm Yev Muchnik. Um, I'm an attorney based out of Colorado. I, ooh, hello. Um, I am with Launch Legal and Jason Weiner PC. We do a lot of work in the DAO co-op space um, and have put together some really cool legislative efforts that will be coming up soon, so stay tuned for that too here in Colorado. Um, I'm, I'm Jacqueline Radebaugh. I am an attorney with Jason Wine and PC as well. Um, I work with cooperatives, worker ownership, various forms of shared ownership, um, values forward uh, groups, and since last summer, I've been working closely with YAV, helping DAOs to adopt a legal entity that matches with their values, and that happens to be Colorado Limited Cooperative Association as far as I'm concerned. So, good to be here. That's great. Thanks, guys. So, um, in talking about DAOs, we sort of want to talk a little bit about the history of what those mean in the state of Colorado, at least. Um, there's a massive amount of intersectionality between the digital concept of DAOs and the historical concept of co-ops, and luckily Nathan has some great insight into the history of how that has played out within the state of Colorado. Great, yeah, we, you know, my grandfather was born in uh, uh, Jones, Jamestown up in northern Colorado and, and born in a, a, on a farm with no electricity. And, um, and that farm only got electricity when the financing became available to create a co-op group of people coming together, neighbors, um, building a, uh, a, a community-owned and governed organization that brought electricity to that community. And so this is a tradition that brings together a lot of the, the values that are bringing people into DAOs, to enable a kind of participatory economy. Cooperative principles include, for instance, excuse me, for instance, autonomy the ability of members to really control their organization, uh, democratic participation, that ability for participants to, through their participation, have control over what they're doing, um, and, uh, and, and community capital, so enabling uh, members to uh, uh, be involved financially and to see the rewards of the value that they're creating. So this is a legacy that has a lot in common with DAOs. It's not a legacy that our society, I think, has empowered and enabled as much as it could. And one of the things that really excites me about what's going on in crypto in general, and particularly here in Colorado, is the ability to build on that legacy in new ways with DAOs and with these new tools that are coming online. Tools which can be really an operating system for community ownership, for building on that legacy, um, but in ways that are supercharged by, uh, by this new technology stack. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, 
Yeah, how, how, does, how did the co-op laws in Colorado enable uh, DAO and corporations within the state? Yeah, we, we've been working with a, a number of DAO co-ops, um, including Spork DAO and the Employment Commons. Um, the LCA statutes are incredibly flexible. They allow for um, patron members to be rewarded for contributions in the community. Um, and it's, it, it really rivals um, LLCs in so many ways. I don't know if we have enough time to speak about it on this panel, but, but really the kind of the overlap of, of principles, like Nathan was saying, um, is, is really evident in, in co-ops and DAOs. And LCAs also allow an investor member class um, in a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So um, I'm sure Jackie could speak more to it as well. Yeah, it's, it's good to see a, a legal entity type that actually builds in the values um, as part of the legal framework so that um, you, know, you have all that flexibility to change things and then you are subject to takeover sometimes and things that you might want to prevent early on and the model itself brings enough flexibility but also enough protections for uh, those values that you have committed to as, as a group, as a DAO or as a cooperative to remain uh, in the structure uh, despite or, or, or regardless of how many you know, contributors come in and out. So it kind of recognizes all the patronage contributions that has been done, allows for distributions to be made on that basis, um, and again, without uh, harming or without detriment to the values that we want to keep uh, in the movement. I'll, I'll, I'll just add that we've had a, a, a really terrific success with layering DAO tooling on top of traditional co-ops. So Moloch DAOs and, and colony um, governance styles. And it, they've really kind of been a seamless adaptation on top of the LCA. Cool. So I, I think that there are some, some uh, a very few number of states that actually have uh, legislation on the books that, uh, that deal directly with co-ops and sort of help enable that on-ramp for DAOs. But Wyoming's done something interesting as well, which doesn't, uh, doesn't involve co-op law, but is specific to a DAO as an LLC. Caitlin, do you have any information? Yeah, the concept, why would you bother to register your organization as a legal entity? And the answer is that the state, with legal entity registration, bestows something in exchange for the registration, which is limited liability for the participants. And a limited liability company is just that. It's a limited liability organization. Um, it does need to be centralized. There are a lot of DAOs that registered as Delaware LLCs, Delaware being the state with the most common uh, corp uh, business entity registration. Uh, but Wyoming is actually number two behind Delaware. And Wyoming created a special version of the LLC called a DAO LLC. That is a mind bender because it's a contradiction. If, how can you have a centralized entity that's also a DAO? And the answer is it, it's a hybrid. If it's a pure DAO, it wouldn't fit in the Wyoming model. But a pure DAO that doesn't register potentially is what's called a general partnership under the law. And one of the biggest concerns I had dating way back, almost 10 years ago, is that crypto was going to get tripped up as general partnership. And all of a sudden, there was going to be limit joint, what's called joint and several liability, which is each participant in the organization is liable to the maximum extent of the losses of the organization. That you don't want. Um, and so what Wyoming did with the Dow LLC is say, all right, there has to be a human being involved. It, doesn't ha it can be decentralized to the extent that there's at least one what's called control person. And what's happened is there are about probably 200 or so that have registered in Wyoming since the Dow LLC law took effect in July. Some of the more prominent ones in the industry have registered there. And uh, there is a control person. What's the benefit of pursuing the hybrid organization? Uh, aside from getting limited liability for the members, it's also that as a control person, the entity can register for a bank account or a securities account. If there's not a control person, so a true DAO, a true co-op, would not have a control person, and therefore it's, it's a lot harder to 
uh, to qualify under the Know Your Customer rules to get a bank or securities accounts. So some of the more interesting DAOs that have been involved in purchasing securities actually have securities accounts. In order to keep those accounts available, you need to have at least one person who's a control person. Um, and that's what keeps the entity alive. The other benefit of doing it, um, keeps it registered rather, the, the other benefit of doing it that way is that you get um, the long term, um, essentially, you, the, the, the DAO could, could create code as the operating agreement. Under the LLC laws, technically you're required to have an operating agreement and lawyers, we've got lawyers at the table here today, um, are very practiced at putting those pieces of paper together, typically 30, 40 pages um, for an LLC operating agreement. But uh, the Wyoming Dow expressly requires the judge in the event of a dispute to look to the code. I think that's the first time that I know of in, in the law where, the, the, where a judge is given a roadmap and told if there's a dispute involving this entity, you must look to the code. And so that means that the lawyers have to understand how to read code and the judges have to go get experts and there has to be a court that has the ability to take code in as evidence. That's a huge uh, step forward because it's uh, it pre up until this point, pretty much everything is analog. And Wyoming said, all right, if you set up a Dow LLC, your, your operating agreement can be in the form of code. We're getting a lot closer to the concept of code is law, which I know is a mantra in this community. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. So uh, one interesting question I've got about that control person and the, the sort of requirement to have a traditional bank account, one of the main reasons to have that bank account for a company um, it occurs to me is to, uh, to pay taxes and to pay your state fees and all of those good things. Um, Governor Polis announced a little bit earlier tonight that Colorado would start accepting payments in crypto. Um, that applies to individuals, but it also presumably applies to uh, corporations, companies, uh, LLCs, and co-ops as well. So. Uh, with that in mind, I think that the ability to pay your taxes in crypto allows for truly crypto-native organizations to be able to thrive um, within the state. Obviously, we still have some federal hurdles to get over, um, but I think as states like Colorado and Wyoming sort of blaze the trail, we're going we're gonna to pull a lot more of the country together with us uh, and hopefully make those changes on a, on a higher level. Um, does anyone have any input around what those what that might mean? Any any good insight about taxes and crypto? Better not to have any taxes. <laughs> that's that's true for Wyoming, but we like our schools and roads here in Colorado. Yeah, if you have to university. pay the taxes, it's better to be able to pay them in crypto for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so. Uh, I also wanted to touch a little bit on some stuff that's been going on in, in both of our states, and that is with regards to the UCC uh, regulations. Um, I think that there are, you know, Uniform Commercial Code is on the books in every state in the union. They all have somewhat different laws. Wyoming's recently made some amendments to their UCC codes. Uh, I believe that Colorado has is, is been considering some similar changes as well in order to provide a little bit more uh, blockchain and crypto-friendly uh, environment for businesses to thrive. Um, does anybody want to talk about UCC? We, lo we love what UCC is. I'll throw a special thank you. I don't see him. Um, Senator Lummis's general counsel is here tonight. She's been just awesome. And he was the person who drafted the Wyoming UCC amendment. So he's here. I don't see him at the moment. He's in a red sweatshirt. Uh, but um, what is the UCC? The Uniform Commercial Code is the fundamental basis of all commercial transactions. Every one of us uses it every day. And uh, it's really boring, but it's really foundational. And the challenge with the Uniform Commercial Code, it was written in the 1950s when everything was physical. And it has struggled to deal with anything that's digital, much less anything that's decentralized. And so Wyoming was the first to change the UCC. Um, and there are two aspects of it that Wyoming um, 
led the way, and the rest of the United States is following, thank goodness, because it's, a, it's state law. You need all 50 states to recognize this. And the two things that Wyoming did that, that will be recognized nationwide probably within the next few years, there's a group called the Uniform Law Commission that has proposed a whole new amendment called Uniform uh, UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, Article 12. And that recognizes digital assets, and it, and it does two very important things. It recognizes what's called super negotiability, which means that if you are a, um, a, a good faith purchaser of the asset, you take it free and, claim, free and clear of any adverse claims. Ergo, if somebody stole it and then turned around and sold it to you, and you took it in good faith and you didn't know that it was stolen goods, it's yours. You have legal title to it. It's called super negotiability. Uh, and the other thing that is really important to the DeFi world is the understanding of how to what's called perfect a security interest so a lender can seize the collateral in the event of a default on the loan. And that, it used to be, believe it or not, when we started this process, the lawyers all wanted the perfection of security interest in paper form. <laughs> and the, the filing in most states is still in paper by snail mail. And that just didn't work for crypto. And so they moved to, uh, after Wyoming started this, they moved to a basically um, possession is nine tenths of the law, as they say. If, if you possess and control the private keys, you, you, you have the security interest in the asset. Um, these are critical moves that are going to really help um, smooth the way for our industry to flourish, but also take a lot of bad lawsuits out of the courts. I, I've been asked to get involved in, in interesting UCC type lawsuits and ca California law is totally screwed up. I'm sure there are a lot of Californians here, um, but, but the law that applies to crypto in California is pawn shop law because of collectibles. In the lack of any other law, it kind of makes sense that lo the law applying to pawn shops might apply to crypto, but that's crazy. And we need to fix that, and we will be fixing that in the next couple of years. Thanks, Caitlin. That was a great, great backstory. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, and I believe in, your, in, in Wyoming, you don't actually have to be in the state to perfect the security interest. So, or the, 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 the digital asset doesn't have to be in the state. And we're actually working on something like that in Colorado. There was a bill that went through the house yesterday. Portion of it was re revised, but I think that it's going to be coming through in the next legislative session as well. Yeah, certainly. I think that, um, you know, the states are doing well with trying, some are doing well, some are do not doing so well with trying to apply older, older legislation to the newer dynamics. And I think that co-op and Dow, Regulation is is falls more into the doing well part. The the pawn shop and and uh, crypto law does not so much. So let's see. Um, we covered a little bit of ground there. Um, I didn't get much of a bite on the on the crypto tax stuff, other than it's better to pay it in crypto than not. Um, I personally will probably always always pay my tax bill in in cash rather than in my. Uh, rather than in my safe and, and appreciating crypto assets. But there we go. Well, speaking of those assets, you know, I, I think a really important thing to recognize that states and, and other levels of government need to start thinking about is equity, right? Is about who has the ability to play in this in this kind of uh, in this kind of world, you know, we have a regime in the existing startup world, uh, you know, and this is at the federal level uh, that expects, you know, essentially it's a wealthy person's game, right? And we have an opportunity to rewrite those rules, and I think the challenge is to make sure to do that in a way that protects people who don't have a lot to lose, um, but ensures that people who uh, who are really creating value, even if they don't have a lot, of, a lot of wealth, can start building that wealth through these tools. This is, again, something that that, that co-op tradition uh, really brings forward. Here in Colorado, in you know, analog space, one thing that the, the governor is leading on in addition to crypto is, is actually supporting employee ownership conversions. You know, so just a, a couple of years ago, New Belgium Brewing, the, brewery up in Fort Collins was sold to a conglomerate and, uh, and all those workers 
took home a really good uh, uh, payout re uh, because of that of that transaction because that's a hundred percent it was a hundred percent employee owned company. Um, the state is starting to encourage more of those kinds of conversions, um, and it poses the question here about how um, our communities can help both from the regulatory perspective as well as from um, actually enabling and supporting communities to participate, make sure that this isn't just a whales game, right? That crypto is something that um, really enables community wealth to grow and enables communities to participate in the same way, you know, for instance, my, you know, my grandfather's community was able to participate in building uh, their own, you know, electrical system when the investor-owned utilities wouldn't go there. Yeah, and then I, I feel like it's important to to talk about the fact that you know, cooperatives laws are well established around the country. There are hundreds of those. All almost all states have adopted cooperative laws. Uh, Colorado does happen to have six different uh, cooperative laws uh, from various levels, based on sector or interest. So the LCA, the Limited Cooperative. Um, Association law adopted in 2012 addresses some of those um, needs that uh, can be very specific to your group, right? So we we talk about sharing ownership. What does that mean? Sharing governance, sharing financial returns, uh, to what extent and based on what? So that can be based on how much money you put, which is very traditional. But in the cooperative movement, and I think in the DAO movement, it's. Uh, as Nathan is pointing out, is about the contributions and your participation and that it can be counted for the returns that come out of there. So uh, super important, that's a factor that we work very closely with uh, DAOs looking for a legal wrapper is what, what is your relationship, your who are your contributors, um, who are the main stakeholders of this this group and how you can benefit and how do you want to benefit from this together, making decisions together and getting to that design that really works for a group where you can have a cooperative that really benefits the members through the, the life of it, like the brewery, but also allows the members to make that call and say, hey, this worked well, worked really well for us for a really long time. Now we want to get the paycheck and just you know exit out of this as well, which it's a democratic decision that you can make as a group as well. That's awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, wrap up the panel with a with a practical question that maybe some of the uh, DAO founders or potential founders who haven't already gone through the process might be interested in learning, and that's. Uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you for the hourly rate that you guys are charging, but I would be interested in knowing how long, what's the effort, the level of effort, uh, in order to get all the paperwork filed and get your DAO registered? I would start with the attorney answer. It depends. Uh, and it depends on how prepared the group is to get legal support. Sometimes we're going to just tell you, you know, you need to do a little bit more homework. You might need to actually figure out how you're operating. Are you actually operating? Um, and then if you're ready for it, you have a little track record of being working as a group. Again, uh, we work at your white paper. We will encourage you to have a business plan, but you don't, might not have to. Just need to figure out your revenue model. Um, and then it can take you know, from a, a month to a year plus uh, working on closely with the design portion or with just the drafting. So there's, and I think we've, uh, Yev and I have worked with a, a good enough number of DAO that have adopted the co cooperative model that we're able to offer, um, have you know, fees offering that address that account for the experience we have gathered from the DAO um, and Web3 uh, sector, and then um, kind of build on what the expertise we already bring from the cooperative practice as well. I think I'll add to that to say that ultimately our position as lawyers is not to act as gatekeepers. So we really you know, are working with the communities at large. We are working to make onboarding a lot more simpler. Um, we've been in talks with Cali DAO as well to templatize like a version one of, um, of, of a DAO co-op, so look out for that if you follow Cali DAO and Lex DAO. Um, but really, I mean, it's, the purpose is to serve the community and to find a way to make them compliant, to shield them from liability, to be able to manage their treasur treasuries effectively, and to really to kind of benefit the bigger ecosystem. 
I'm, I'm not a practicing attorney, but I know if you have everything together, it can be done in 15 minutes. It's very simple. And I have no idea, but my, <laughs> but here in Colorado, if you're interested in developing new models and having a conversation partner, um, at, up at CU Boulder, we have a media enterprise design lab. We can't help you, help you with uh, uh, with registration or anything like that, but we do love to bounce ideas around with people who are developing innovative kinds of uh, community ownership and governance. Can I just add, so uh, with Jason Weiner PC, we just created a um, course, a co-op course, that you can just go through the website, not pay, you just kind of sign in. Um, and you can learn more about the structure, the cooperative, and kind of figure out if that works for you. Uh, it takes care of some of the education aspect and some of our material for DAO co-ops are there as well. So you can address some of the things before talking with an attorney. So awesome. Thanks so much, guys. This was Thank a great you. panel. Thank you. Look forward to hearing those Avanti announcements.